the UK Data Service brings together some of the most robust and complex quantitative and qualitative survey data produced by research institutions, governments and non-governmental organisations in the UK and internationally. We're funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and it, we're effectively a one-stop shop for high quality social, economic and population data. The data is used by a range of people and organisations, so it's not just academic re researchers and students, government analysts, charities, think tanks, consultants and so on. And hopefully you'll notice that from some of the people that you meet during the day here today. Where the data comes from, as you can see, there's quite a few different places that the data comes from, including official agencies, um, research institutions and so on. We've got a variety of types of data in the service. We have lots of survey data and lots of longitudinal data. So survey data, things like understanding society that some of you will come across, labour force survey, family resources survey, longitudinal studies, ones that um, record data about people over time. So things like the 1970 British cohort study and the millennium cohort study to name just two. We've got census data available, which includes aggregate data, Microdata and flow data, aggregates, everything put together. I'm sorry if that sounds really obvious. Microdata is controlled data for it, look, looking at individual records. Um, and we'll talk about some specific supports and opportunities there are for ECRs throughout through the service later. So it's time for me to welcome Professor Donald Hirsch to the podium as our keynote speaker. We're delighted to have Donald with us today. Just a little bit about him, in case you've not come across him, and shame on you if you haven't. He has been analysing trends and policies related to poverty and low income for over four decades. In the 1980s, he was a journalist, latterly on The Economist. In the 1990s, after a period at the OECD, he was an international politi policy consultant, and between 98 and 2008, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation's poverty advisor. He played a central role in establishing the minimum income standard for the United Kingdom, joining Loughborough's Centre for Research in Social Policy in 2008 to lead the work on that. And he was director of that centre from 2012 to 2022. Since retiring from Loughborough, he's been a policy advisor to Aberdeen Financial Fairness Trust, which funds a range of research related to income, assets and spending. He established the original basis for a UK-wide living wage, now paid by thousands of employers. His work has contributed to strategies to combat child poverty and fuel poverty. His work has provided ev an evidence base for a more generous legal aid means test announced in 2022. It gives charities tools to prioritise financial aid for families in need. Just so you know, the slides from today will be shared with you after this event and Donald's talk is being recorded and will be shared on our website in the next few weeks. When Donald has finished, Rhiannon Williams, who's one of our current Data Impact Fellows, will join um, Donald to moderate the Q&A. We'll have roving mics, so when it comes to the question time, you can just raise your hand and one of, once Rhiannon picks you, we'll be able to, to come and find our a, find a way over to you. But for now, over to you, Donald. Uh, good morning. Um, as you heard, I've been involved in this game for quite a long time. Um, my first job was actually um, in 1981 um, working for a youth unemployment tr charity. Um, so that was when I f first became interested in evidence about poverty and low income and, and, and social issues. Um, conversely, um, I think some of you will still be, I hope, looking at this probably in, into the 2050s or maybe even 2060s. So that's qu quite, quite, quite a, long, a long time period. And, and I should start by saying that, you know, we usually have sort of grumbling about sort of the lucky, lucky boomers and unlucky millennials. Well, I think you're very fortunate in at least one respect, and that's been referred to already, which is the rich data sources that, that we now have. I mean, we've got five uh, active cohort studies, quite apart from all the other longitudinal studies, cross-sectional studies, um, and new uses of um, administrative data, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. Um, so, I mean, in that context, um, 
I, I want to sort of take a, quite, a, quite a broad view to introduce um, this theme. Um, I mean, the, so we, we, as you've heard, there are plenty of data resources there which allow us, should allow us to, to, to drill down into the causes, um, effects, and, and solutions for, for poverty. Um, but in deciding what, what, what to ask, it's, it's probably useful um, to start by reflecting on the big picture, which is how poverty has developed in recent years, how the environment ha has changed, um, as well as some of the data sources having changed, um, and what, what we can know from the data. So that, that's the context that I'm going to, going to sort of give this introductory talk. Um, and probably, you know, I'm sure that in discussion later we can get to some more of the nitty gritty things, but I, I'm, I'm very much trying to give the big picture. Um, so, as I say, when I came in in the 1980s, um, what was the big question? Well, after the, after the Second World War, there'd been a lot of programs like sort of house building and, and you know, sort of social democratic type programs um, to, to imp improve things. But, but a, a man called Peter Townsend um, wrote some really influential studies in the, in, in the 70s showing how the... the the realities of how people were still living in poverty despite all, 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 all of this work. So, so then along came somebody called Margaret Thatcher, um, and in the 80s the theme was, you know, it's not about all these programmes, it's not about um, trying to sort of focus money and redistribute money, it's all about getting growth because a rising tide lifts all ships, and we've heard a bit of that um, more recently in different contexts. Um, so the first thing I'm going to show you is um, what I think is possibly the most influential graph on this subject in my working life, which showed, no, that's not true. Now, this graph is, uh, came from a commission from uh, the late, great John Hills, um, sadly died a couple of years ago, um, who, who in the, in the mid-90s ran an inquiry to look at what really had happened during the 1980s and the early 90s when we had had eventually some pretty healthy growth. And these, these are income decile groups, um, and it shows the to each of the bar, pairs of bars shows the total amount of income growth or reduction um, in real terms over the, peri over the period of 1979 to, to 92. And it's really striking because not only um, have the poor done worst, but, but each successive group, um, decile group, did, did better. And, it, and interestingly, that negative green bar, it shows something which hadn't been looked at previously but has been looked at a lot since then, which is um, income after housing costs. So it's taking into account uh, the fact that housing was going a lot more expensive. Um, and, and it, the reason I say it was the most influential is because it was a real turning point, I think, in the debate um, where we started to think actually relative poverty is important. <laughs> it's not just about trying to lift the average. It's not uh, that actually in absolute terms the, 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 there was a reduction um, for, for, for the poorest groups. But, but the, that really what we should be trying to do um, is to um, ensure that as the economy grows, that people at the bottom get a fair share of, of, of that growth. It, and that, that influenced the new Labour government, who, who then made a pledge to end child poverty by 2020. Uh, 2020 has come and gone, and child poverty is rather high, as I'm going to show you. Um, but, that, but a lot was achieved. Um, so that was where... But I do think that that was a, a, an important point where data really sort of changed the debate. Um, to, to give you a bit more detail about what's happened over the years since 1979, um, for those who can't see the, those bottom things are just dates starting from, from 79 to, um, to, to the present. Um, the source is very interesting here. I'd just like to highlight this. You'll be, you'll be sent the slides so you can look at this. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, who, who produces a lot of good stuff, have just from this year produced um, at this site the most fantastic spreadsheet that any, anyone who loves these things would, you know, can spend hours on. It goes right back to 1961. It has just about every kind of, um, every kind of sort of income measure that you can think of, and, and, and it's very useful to be able to look at trends. So what I've looked at over this period is 
Um, the, the, the bars are showing poverty rates with, with the, the, the green ones, um, child poverty rates, and the, and the gray ones, general poverty rates. Um, and the, but these are relative, this is relative poverty. Um, that's numbers of, peop of, of people in households with below 60% median income. Um, and the blue line, which I put on a log scale because I, I want to show the rate of change, um, shows what the median income actually was. So it's relevant to know both how many people are below, living below a certain level and also what that level is. Um, and uh, and I, I would identify three periods, which I think are very interesting that come out of this chart. Um, the first is, 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 in a way, reflecting what, what I've already shown you on the previous graph, which is that rising tides doesn't li lift all ships. It leaves, lives, leaves the poor beached. In other words, they're, they're, not, they're not sort of benefiting from the rising tide. So the, the blue line is going up quite a bit, but so are, so are the bars showing that there are more people living below 60% of, of, of that line. Um, then, and then the good, good news bit, um, which lasted for about 10 years from just before the new Labour government came in to a few years before they left, um, when th there was still quite rapid... Um, real terms growth in, in, in incomes. Uh, the, the, in other words, the, the blue line was still quite steep upwards, but there was actually, um, but the number of people who were below 60% of that was, was actually coming down. And so actually people were not just rising with the tide, but I don't know whether surfing is the right metaphor, but they were actually sort of rising faster than the tide. Um, and that was with a huge effort, um, a, a redistributive effort particularly, and, and a, a growth in, in employment rates among certain groups. Uh, unfortunately, since then, there's, there's been two not-so-good trends. I mean, it's fairly flat, but it shows, so very importantly, um, income growth has stalled and just stopped, really. Um, and there's been ups and downs, but, but the, the relative poverty rate has, has remained still pretty high by certainly by comparison with the beginning of that period. Um, so um, it's rising more slowly and, and, and poverty is stuck. Um, now, more recently, um, it's during this fairly flat period in terms, of the, in terms of those overall figures, it can be quite difficult to interpret what's going on. I mean, if, the government has recently been still saying, oh, well, you know, that on some measures, Poverty is coming down, but then we see all this increase in food banks. Um, the, gov the government is now measuring, um, is now, I'll show you this later, is, is now measuring food insecurity, and that's going up. But the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has a very good survey of, of destitution, which shows, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more than doubled um, in, in the last few years. And yet, when you look at the sort of Poverty rates it, it's not capturing this for various reasons, um, partly probably because it's people right down near the bottom, which isn't always easy to measure, especially with surveys, but also because um, we, we haven't, as, as is widely publicised, we happen to have had um, a driving force called in inflation, which has been concentrated on, on, on basic goods um, such as food and, and fuel, so that um, that those are things which are consumed in relatively greater quantities by people who, who are on low incomes. So, so the inflation rate which is being used to measure what's so-called absolute poverty, which is really just poverty against a fixed line, um, it understates the inflation rate um, and, and what's happening in real terms for those people. Um, and I can, talk, I can answer questions about that later if you wish. Um, so... Um, I want to just talk then a bit about the changing contexts in which we need to think about, uh, about poverty and, and data about poverty um, during this period that I've just described, and, and, and obviously going forward particularly. Um, so the first is, is as I've mentioned, the, the median real income growth. It's just changed incredibly. And, and, and this, is, this, is just, this is just an astonishing chart because... When I, for a lot of the time that I've been working with this, we've just assumed that there's going to be a 2% real terms increase in, in, in incomes over the long term, 2% two, two, two a year. That's sort of pretty much held for some, at least for the, for the 1980s and 1990s. And then it was actually 
one and a half percent of the 2000s, so that it, it, there were, it, that growth continued, to, as I showed you, to about 2005 and then fizzled out. And by the 2010s, it was less than one percent, and we've had none and none, very little on the horizon in this decade. So it's a very different um, context when you're trying to, I mean, relative poverty and absolute poverty are still much too high, um, but it's harder to think about sort of sharing the fruits of growth when those fruits aren't available. And we must always realize, I mean, we must think about that change context when we think about sort of influencing policy and practice. Um, but also, I think that, that when, for a lot of the time that I've been looking at this, in particular when we're talking about relative poverty, when, when we were clearly becoming a more affluent society, a lot of the debate was about, about social needs. Um, there were surveys of, of what people, th the poverty and social exclusion, it's poverty and social exclusion survey, um, which, the, which had been run at Bristol, um, look, asked people what do you think is essential and then looked at num where, where the majority of people think that something is essential, how many people are lacking it because they can't afford it. Um, that, that, that's a, a, a deprivation measure. Um, a lot of the emphasis was on things which, like sort of being able to have friends around or um, just have a very simple weekend away or a holiday, or you know, things which were not about survival but about social participation. And the work which I do on minimum income standards is about that. Uh, often people would still say, oh, well, yes, people aren't really in poverty if they, if it's, if, if, if they can eat enough, but that was a big debate. Um, now, sadly, for the wrong reasons, um, the debate has changed um, to much more about do people have enough to eat and, and heat their homes. Um, and and so, the, the, so, for example, with that poverty and social exclusion survey, they picked up, you know, maybe 20 or 30 percent of people didn't, weren't able to do certain social things, but the number of people who couldn't, up, uh, the last one was in 2012, the number of people who, who, didn't, who couldn't afford two meals a day was still quite limited, um, and, and there's probably sort of sample error for, for those such small numbers. Um, but now, you know, we, we've got, um, we've got a, a measure which is that the government is actually running for the first time, looking at, at what they call food insecurity. That's part of the family resources survey which is used for the households below average income measure. And, we, and it's both high and rising, the number of people who are in severe problems related to the ability to, to, to buy food and afford a healthy diet. Um, that, I think, profoundly changes the, the, the debate about poverty and profoundly changes the ways in which evidence um, needs to be brought to be able to influence things. Um, and then, of course, we've had two sort of big discontinuities. Um, I don't have to say much about the pandemic because it's, it's obvious that, that life changed so fundamentally during the pandemic um, that um, all the arguments about what, what it means to be on a low income would, it would have changed. Um, you know, we hope that was a one-off. Um, but of course, there's also fallout from the pandemic in terms of indebtedness and mental health and, and, and other, other, other things that, 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 that we're still living with. Um, inflation is interesting because uh, when I came into this story, as I told you, I mean, inflation was really a thing. And we didn't call it cost of living crisis. We call it inflation. Um, but it was a very different kind of inflation because it was... It, it had kind of built up. It was often about a, about a sort of spiralling cycle of sort of higher wage demands and and increased prices, um, and it, and it, a lot of of salaries and benefits and other things were indexed to inflation because it had been going on for a while. This what this bout has have has come and gone like a thief in the night, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's come really suddenly, and the acceleration of inflation at the beginning caused real problems because things like indexation hadn't sort of caught up. But it's also, let's hope, 
permanently um, come, come down very quickly. But in addition to that, we're, we're not back to where we started because if your, um, if your benefits have been indexed to the consumer prices index, but that's understating the, the, the food element, the food prices are still high. They haven't come down. The, just the rate of increase has come down. And so I think that for some time to come, I don't know how long we'll keep, keep on talking about cost of living crisis. It doesn't suddenly go away just because it's not getting worse. Um, but but there, is, there has been at least a, a one-off fall quite serious in the living standards of people, especially towards the bottom, um, for the reasons I've just mentioned. So we need to take into account that, and that should also influence how we're doing our research. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the growth in data resources, um, especially longitudinal ones, um, and, you know, it's a great resource, isn't it, the UK, the UK HLS, not least because it goes back 33 years. You know, it's just an amazing way of tracking what's happened to people over time, as well as being a, um, a large enough sample to look at, to, to do a lot of cross-sectional analysis as well. Um, but we also have things like the Wealth and Assets Survey, which is really important now for people because of um, the degree to which people ha ha have had to run down that there are savings and some go into debt. Um, the English Longitudinal Survey of Aging is, is one which I think is really quite underused, but um, it seems that we, don't, we haven't got any shortage of sources to go to. We might have limitations on the amount of money we have to go and interrogate those resources, but you know, at least we've got a room full of people here committed to doing it. Um, so but it's not just longitudinal, it's also administrative data. I think it's being made available in, in new ways. I don't know a huge amount about this generally, but I do know that, that in an area which I've worked in, which is um, local poverty data, um, local child poverty data, things have improved enormously because the current series, which comes out with HBAI, um, is, it links together um, administrative information with the, with the surveys and the, and the survey definitions. Um, and so originally, I mean, I actually pioneered some of the just really um, indicated collection which showed differences between areas and therefore, between wards particularly, um, and therefore emphasized how important place was, which, which was a big theme from really 2000 onwards. Um, and it helped reinforce that. But, it, but the data were awful. I mean, it was good to compare things to show that some were, were, were higher than others. But the HMRC at one point was collecting data which just assumed that you were in poverty if you were, in, if you were getting certain in-work benefits. And the in-work measure of poverty was just awful. Now, now they're actually using tax data um, and benefit data and universal credit data. And, and I think this is a sign um, that there's more opportunity to corroborate um, some of the um, survey data with administrative data or to use them in combination, certainly. Um, and, and, I, and, and, and these have become practical tools, particularly for local authorities, because obviously a, the survey data is hopeless when you get down to that level. Um, but I also say that there is a, a really interesting interaction that I've seen over my, my career between producing indicators and actually improving what government does. They never say we're doing this because you're publishing this, this thing, but certainly in this case um, we had a series of quite high profile um, publications with End Child Poverty Campaign on local poverty indicators and I, I, I'd like to think that that influenced the government in actually improving the indicator itself because um, they were always arguing about it and saying how hopeless it was. And we say, well, well, then produce something better. Um, so I think, I think the researchers um, have a huge role to play in, 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 in generating that interest. Um, but then at the same time, I, I've heard different views of this from different people, and some people are saying, oh, it's really getting very difficult the, quality, the data quality is becoming a real problem. Others, I think, who I've talked to say, no, well, it's still 
it's still pretty good as long as you use, use data sensibly. But the two um, big things, of course, is, that, is to maintain response rates, and in particular on the longitudinal surveys, to limit attrition. Um, and, you know, to accept that we're having less face-to-face -face and more online, but also telephone, um, sources of data, but uh, just to try to make sure that we keep an eye on the quality and keep an eye on, on reliability and consistency and robustness. And one way we can do this, of course, is to, is to use multiple sources. And I think that's going to become more important, including um, looking at, at administrative data, which, of course, is at least more reliable in, in, in the sense that it's, you know, it's, it's a complete sample. It's not a sample. It's a complete count of things. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing views about this, actually, because, I mean, I, I'm not at the sharp end of UR, and, and I'd be interested in, in, in how this feels at the moment. Um, and, then, and then we also, over the years, have got sort of new th things that we can use as indicators and reference points. The thing which I've been most involved in is the minimum income standard. It's not a measure of poverty, um, but it does allow... Um, I think for the first time income to be measured against genuinely a, a benchmark of need. Um, in other words, it's looking, the minimum income standard is, is a, a, a study which is being carried out um, every couple of years at Loughborough University, um, funded by Joseph Roundtree Foundation, where, which is based on very, very detailed um, li deliberative focus groups with members of the public going through household budgets for different, different um, household types um, and coming up with something which isn't just a dire poverty measure, it's, it's, it's a, an acceptable lev living standard measure, it's a decent living standard and it's about being able to um, afford mat the material things of life as well as being able to participate in society. So it's always going to be higher than what we call poverty or, or indeed benefit rates but it's still, it still is a reference point and you can see which way it's moving and it can be used in all sorts of interesting ways such as setting the living wage which is it's used for but the reason i say it's it's important this benchmark of need is that we don't really otherwise have one because 60 percent of median income is, is 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 a good indicator but it doesn't say that's where you should set the level quite a lot of um benchmarks use expenditures by low-income groups but if low-income groups are constrained to, in meeting their needs or, and become increasingly constrained in meeting their needs, then their expenditures will go down, but their needs won't. And so I think it's, it's been a very important development to, to have this, and it's the thing which delights me the most is that I've been able to retire and, and my great colleagues have been able to continue doing this work. Um, they're, they're, there's a fantastic team there, and um, long may it continue. Um, Joseph Rowntree Foundation has, has funded a series of destitution surveys, which I think is very, very important in the context of what I was talking about earlier, where things are happening below the radar because not everybody is a member of a household um, and low incomes are very hard to, to measure. The, the lowest incomes are very hard to measure through, through, through the standard household surveys because um, of sample size, but also confusion with people who have low income because they're in a very temporary way because they made a loss this year and self-employed, but they could be quite, quite well off. So um, the destitution service have been a real eye-opener, particularly in terms of that, that graph I showed you earlier sh showing how much destitution has sadly increased in recent years. Um, and then there's a new one which I've got sort of slightly mixed feelings about, but, but it's certainly very important, which is um, a, a new indicator which was actually published Officially, I think it's an experimental one still this year. It comes from the Social Metrics um, Commission, but it has been taken up by the government, Below Average Resources, which tries to look at incomes. It's actually, actually, it isn't as radical as it sounds because it does start with a 60% median baseline, and it will still be very... Well, it's not, it's not exactly 60% median, but it's a proportion of the median um, baseline, um, which will be very influential in, in, in looking at the trends in this. But it also takes into account... Um, it obviously subtracts housing costs, which we've already done for some time. Um, it, it, it takes into account liquid assets, so if you have savings, um, then it takes into account the ability to use those. Um, but it also tries to look at other costs, childcare, um, disability, um, although disability is very imperfect, so it uses the 
the um, amount you get in extra cost benefits as a proxy for your disability costs. Um, uh, but also it's trying to, it, it hopes to look at things like debt and other inescapable costs such as home energy, travel to work. It's tricky because in, you know, what is an inescapable cost? Is it, is it what people spend? Is it what we think they should be spending? Certainly with, with fuel poverty measures, it's about what we think they need to spend, but how do you work that out? Um, it's not going to be a perfect measure and it's going to be partial, but, but what it emphasizes that rightly, I think, is that, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? It's, it's that your income doesn't tell you everything about, about your poverty. Um, it's also about how much you need to spend on different things and whether that's different for different people and, of course, indebtedness and savings. So I think that's one to watch and to try to think about how, how we can use in an intelligent way. Um, now, the other thing, I, I did talk about how I thought a lot was happening below the radar, and one of the great things about this, this fantastic resource from the Institute of Fiscal Studies is it does go right down to 40% of median income, which is very low, very low. Um, and if you look over the, that longer period that which I'd, I'd talked about earlier since the, since the beginning of the 80s, um, you see that both the number below 60% median and the number below 40% median have, have, have increased, and that increase came largely in, in the beginning of that period, and it's been relatively flat since then. But this graph is wrong. Um, why is it wrong? Uh, because it, it uses a, a, a standard um, linear scale, and if you look down at the bottom, it starts from very low, the 40% median. So let's put it on, onto a log scale, and you see the difference that it's gone from very little, um, very few people living below 40% of the median to really a very substantial number, but most of that growth come, having come in the, in the 80s and early 90s. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just a bit, a bit too obsessed with the past and, and, and I shouldn't worry about it at all. And we should really, if we started, our, if we started history at in the year 2000, things would look very different. But at least it shows that, you know, there was a period when things were better <laughs> in those terms, in terms of, in terms of um, inequalities. Um, and, and that, so I say that, you know, poverty is very high by historic standards. And you wouldn't say that if you would start that graph in, in, nine, in 2000. And it's also high by international standards as well. So, um, just briefly, how am I doing on time? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Um, I just want to f finish before concluding by just mentioning four particular projects, very biased towards ones which I've been involved in or my centre has been involved in because that's what I know about, but I'm sure these are just examples, which have used um, insights onto the contemporary questions and, that, in other words, it takes into account how, how things are changing. Um, the, the first one was... Uh, the question, how was COVID affecting low-income households? And this was something which wasn't obvious because everyone was saying, oh, we're all in it together. We're all, we're all uh, you know, having to, having to go through the same experiences. But actually, it was fairly obvious from our research on, on what you need as a minimum that it would be different for, for better-off people because, because better-off people were, or people who, were, who had the minimum were, were, had spending on holidays, which they, they were saving, right? Um, people who, who were below the minimum or people who were, who were on low incomes were not having that saving because they weren't, they weren't going on holiday in the first place because they couldn't afford to, whereas they were suffering from children at home emptying the fridge and a lot of other pressures, a lot of other financial pressures um, which came at that time. And so... So the, there was a very good co collaborative effort called the COVID Realities Project, where, where a lot of this um, research was pooled. It was a great, a great sort of example of, of collaboration in this field. And it was also multi-method, you know, qualitative and quantitative, um, and, and uh, user voice as well. Not user, what do we call it? Uh, uh, lived experience, that's the one, yeah. Lived experience, yeah. So, so they, they, that was brought together, and I think it, it did create a sort of... I think it was influential. I mean, we had an increase in, in the universal credit payments at that time, which there was a very big consensus of continuing. It wasn't continued eventually, 
But it did go on probably longer than it would have done if, had it not been for that sort of shared understanding that things were really tough for people um, on low incomes at, in that period. And, and that's, that's a, a heartening, um, rapid response to, in, in, in a, an academic community which can move quite slowly at times. Um, and, and I think that's something to take an example from. And we've had similar, those, those sorts of efforts have continued during, the, during the, the next crisis we had, which was the cost of living crisis. Um, and then, there was an issue, then there's an issue which I mentioned earlier, which is about higher cost of living um, increases for low-income households, because obviously the, the inflation indices are, are based on an average expenditure pattern. And... Um, the things which, are, which, is proportionally, which, which people with, on low income proportionally spend more on had been going up faster than average. Um, and there's, there's been quite a, um, a sophisticated and um, detailed look. It's not easy um, by, by, my, by the Loughborough team that I was part of um, for Aberdeen, um, who was a funder of social research. And, and they were just trying to look at actually the, the essential items which they put in their baskets. How, how was that, um, how, how were those items changing in, in the food, in the index and looking at it month to month. And, and did conclude in, in, in their initial findings that there's been substantially higher rates of increase in essentials than CPI, but this can vary quite a lot by, by household type. It's all very specific, it's not simple. And, and, and it's also not systematic in the sense that there will be other times, um, and there have been other times recently, when the reverse is true. So around sort of 2016, 2017, there was, uh, food prices were actually going down, um, and while well, inflation was sort of flat or very modestly upwards. So it, it, you, you mustn't, we mustn't sort of say this is always the case, that inflation is, is higher. Uh, for lower income groups, although it depends on what's pushing it. And it also that comes back to a very interesting point about in the 70s it was being pushed by something, by, by overheating of the economy rather than um, by other, other factors like energy costs increasing. Well, it, in the early 70s it was energy costs, but later it was sort of, it was, it was, it was more about sort of wage push inflation, as they called it. So that helps influence what things are becoming becoming more expensive if, if, it's, if it's more to do with the sort of push of wages and things like services can become more, more, more expensive. But if it's coming from things like energy, then it's basically commodities that are becoming more expensive. And it's really important. Um, we don't have to be economists to be interested in, in, in these things, but maybe we can dabble in economics um, to, to try to think about um, you know, what, what kind of trends there are in prices and what's driving it. Um, the third one was something which a colleague of mine, um, Juliet Stone, did recently um, for an organisation called Christians Against Poverty, um, who, who, who deal with, um, help people with debt, um, and it was really showing the extent to which um, the running down of savings and the in increases in debt were, the accumulation of debt were becoming um, more important um, relative to income um, than, than, than had been the case in the past um, in terms of their effect on the net amount that people have to, to be able to afford a minimum living standard. And so, again, it's sort of showing that income it, income's always important, but it's, some of these other things are, have become more important as a result of... I mean, some of the online surveys sort of show very, quite alarming numbers of people um, in the last couple of years using, using savings or, or borrowing, running down savings or increasing borrowings just to afford everyday things. And that, that's a very worrying trend which we need to keep an eye on. Um, and then um, this is more of a qualitative study which, um, which was um, showing that, again, it's not just income or even financial resources. It can often be, be support from family and friends that makes a real difference to how people experience um, having income that's below what, what, what in general people need. And that people who, who did have a lot of family support tended to 
that tended to be the determinant of stability and when things went wrong to have that backup. And you know, this is a reflection on, on, unfortunately, some things which you just can't rely on the state for and people feel that, especially on low incomes, especially with instability in their lives, that they need to be able to have something reliable to fall back on and that's their families if they, if they have them and if they're available for, for, for that kind of help, whether it's childcare or sometimes financial assistance or, or other forms of help. Um, and, in, and this is reflected um, in, in a quite interesting American study um, which shows that social capital among lone parents um, creates, or the lack, of, the lack of it creates huge vulnerabilities among those who, who don't have it. So that's a big, that was a kind of tour d'horizon of the, of, of, of what was a hopelessly wide field over a hopelessly long period of time. Um, but, to, but what I would really conclude going forward is that um, we would, we, that research needs to, on poverty needs to pay attention to a number of things. First of all, it does need to be versatile. It can be versatile. It can, as we've seen, um, respond to changing agendas, not just get set in, in stone. I, mean, I, know, I know PhDs take a long time and you can't suddenly change your mind about them, but nevertheless, there are all sorts of ways in which people have found to collaborate and to, and to adapt what they're looking at. Um, secondly, um, I do think that, that with quantitative data, it's going to be very important to look at multiple sources, um, both different surveys and, and um, surveys alongside either qualitative data or administrative data. Um, thirdly, um, I think what this, some of the figures I've shown indicates that it's very risky just to look at one line. I mean, for a long time, it was 60% median income, and it was a kind of indicator of how things were going. And during a lot of that period, you know, it wouldn't matter which of those indicators you took, um, they'd still be going in similar directions. But I think there's a risk that different, different levels will go in different directions, and we need to to identify where the problem lies um, and also look at what's called the depth of poverty, which is the total amount that people are below, below a line. And so the total amount of income that would need to be um, generated for everybody to get up to that line. So it, it, it's both the number of people and how far below they are. There, there, there's some very interesting depth measures around. Um, and, and finally, you know, I, I would be encouraging because I think that impact is possible, um, the stakes are very high. Um, there's all sorts of interesting um, points at which evidence is being recognised. And the most recent one which I'd like to leave you with is the Work and Pensions Committee um, in the House of Commons, um, which is a cross-party committee, um, has spent about a year looking at um, the safety net and, 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 and benefit levels, which is something which they've been, they've been very hesitant to look at because it's so political and, it's, and, and, and yet they're cross-party. And they've just come out last month with their report which says quite strikingly that benefit levels are too low and they need to be more evidence-based and we haven't got a, we haven't got a, a proper um, benchmark based on evidence um, for thinking about how benefits should increase going forward. I mean, that's always been the case, but actually when all the evidence seems to be pointing to real hardship, then that becomes more important. And that's a real opportunity to, to follow through on uh, in, in the coming years, that that, that, that has been recognised, that, that if you're going to start talking about large sums of money being redistributed, for example, you need to have evidence of... Of, of, of where, where the difficulties lie and at what point people get into difficulties. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested to hear your responses and your experiences, because as I say, you're at the sharp end, and um, I'm very pleased to met you all today. Thank you. <laughs>